Um, Edward Monk started out as any Norwegian student in, in painting, being taught by one of our, our local heroes, Christian Kirog, and had a very traditional training in that way. You know, we didn't have any academy in Norway. You had to go abroad, mainly in Germany. But um, Krog easily or very early recognized the talent of Edmund Monk, that he was exceptionally talented, as you can see from his very early works. And um, he differed slightly from the normal naturalist idiom by, you know, using more brush strokes and more vivid uh, palette, maybe inspired by what he had read or heard about the Impressionists. But um, his first work that really made, an, uh, made, him, <laughs> made him notorious, actually, was um, The Sick Child, a, a painting that he had worked on for at least a year, he says, a uh, motive that he had in his head from his early childhood when his sister died from tuberculosis. And uh, that is a uh, quite interesting painting because it's made up of layer of layer of paint. It has changed the composition slightly, but the way he works on the very utmost layer by scraping with the, the butt end of his brush, uh, and it's textured in a very different way from, from any contemporary paintings. He kinds of, of incises in the surface like as if it was uh, an engraving in some parts and he uses his hand probably to to brush off or to to dry off the paint so it just you find the red paint in the scratches and very tiny like a small pattern that just gives a, an added atmosphere to the painting itself and then he worked on it for at least 10 years, not because he couldn't uh, let it go as a motive. Well, anyway, he, 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 he repeated it several times during his career, but actually it was a very <clears throat> unsound uh, composition when it comes to painterly technique. So it started flaking very, very early. And I believe that that is one reason why it turns out today to be very different to the left side is very different from the right side because the right side is painted very rapidly in the way he painted 10 years later with heavy brush strokes. And uh, that has caused uh, a headache to many art historians. Why? <laughs> it was like that. I think it's a very pragmatic and simple qu uh, answer to that. Well, anyway, that was his uh, breakthrough as a notorious artist. And from that time on, he, you, you won't find anything like that in Norwegian art, and hardly in, in European or uh, foreign art either. So um, when we come to the scream now, the, the sick child was painted in 1885, 86 first version <laughs> before he started to emulate on it. Um, the screen was painted in 1893 uh, and uh, at that time he was interested in the new tempera paint that you could have in tubes from manufactured and uh, he probably wanted to, to, to um, look at that and see what he could get out of it, experiment with the paint. It gave an, a very different luster, a very different uh, surface from the more fat oil paint. This is a meager lean paint which dries out, that dries up very matte. And um, that's one thing. The scream itself, uh, the motif, is something that I, I will not go into but um, the technique was a very direct one. Not a very elaborate, uh, very, very, probably very, very conscious, but not a very, uh, uh, very experimental. So it started with um, the figure, which he had some idea 
there are many paintings that lead up to the screen, but it's very different. They are all with people. This is a figure or a figure of fear. And uh, it starts with the figure at the outlines, some of the diagonal that creates uh, the drama, the dramatic uh, scenery. And then the wavy lines that kind of echoes his inner feelings, we guess. And the distant people that distances him from the surrounding, uh, the real life. And this is all kind of painted out in, in the colors, the extremely vivid colors. And then he enhances the, the whole thing by, by um, drawing out the outlines with the, with the crayons, wax crayons. And as you can see in, in the blue landscape just behind his head, there are lots of very bright, blue strokes by the, with the crane. And you also find very luminous green ones to the, to the right of him. And um, this combination of the lean paint, the fatty wax crane, and uh, the very subtle way he mixed, blended the colors, not on the palette, but on the this cardboard itself, because it's painted on cardboard, so you have not really a sense of, uh, of the material. The material is in the paint, not in, in the, um, the ground layer. So uh, <clears throat> this all adds up to a very subtle way of, you know, brushing one paint thinly across another one. And you get the third color. It's optically mixed. So there are many very, very clean um, colors that are not mixed on the palette, you know. There are the yellows, some different yellows, and uh, the red ones, very strong yellow. Uh, and then he, he maybe he hit, hit like a whale he brushes across thinly, very th meager, meager paint with some, maybe a lot of um, binding medium, but very little pigment to blend it, you know, and get the, uh, the maximum expression of this. But he hardly mixes the paint on the palette to a very small extent. So you get this scumble effect when colors lie across each other and you can it shines through but then also you have the the background which is the cardboard and um, that plays also a part of the the image because it's not it doesn't have a proper ground layer it's painted directly onto the cardboard without as far as we know no kind of preparation apart from what the, the, uh, the producer of the cardboard itself <laughs> had of a slightly, you know, a, um, a glue surface, gelatine probably. So that plays a part in the painting that you can see the back, background, the, uh, the um, support itself. Of course, over time, this all has changed. So the uh, painting we see today is very different from what it actually was. As far as we know, it has never been cleaned. It's very brittle and it was very brittle already in, in Monk's time. He had it in his ownership for about uh, 17 years, exhibited it a lot of times, had it with him. And you see even a hole in the top in the cardboard that it's probably been nailed to the wall without any frame. He didn't have frames with him when it was traveling. And there are <coughs> spots of, um, of candle wax, tallow, and even bird droppings. Yes, he is very renowned to <laughs> put his painting outdoors. And he had a cottage in Oskarstan where he, probably just to, to look at the paintings, how they, do they compare to each other? 
and also to weather them slightly too. He says that himself, according to his biographers, that he um, wanted the color to, to blend, you know, uh, to be more matte, not as strong, because he, th he thought that his colors were a bit harsh. So <laughs> that also reason. And there's a, the, the third effect then, it's a bonus, that you get the, the bird droppings because <laughs> you put them under the roof that was, you know, standing out a bit. And I, I, I suspect there are swallows because some of them have this really condensated, you know, bird droppings that fall like a rain, that it, it has to be a nest just about, couldn't be just... Uh, the sea girls uh, passing. But uh, strangely enough, he didn't want to, to remove it. So all the, uh, the traces <laughs> from Monk's time is still on the painting, even, even uh, damages that he retouched himself. Very, uh, I mean, no conservative would ever write his name under that, retouches. But it's there, and it's very interesting to see how he looked at his paintings, the way he treated them. That must be a part of his ideas. Uh, That's hard to tell. Why Munch used the tempera could be, of course, that it was uh, new material, uh, at least in the, in the form of tubes. They were used for um, painting uh, decorations at the theater as a cheap paint, mixed a glue paint mainly. But this is not uh, glue temper, it's um, casein, which is a milk substance uh, mixed slightly with, with um, the more traditional egg, like an egg tempera. But it, the, it, the, mainding, the, the main binding medium seems to be the casein, in this case. And uh, I believe it was the new artistic idiom that you have, you want the matte painting. You're more interested in, in <clears throat> the, uh, the surface and the outlines. You have, um, you know, the Gauguin, these, these the French guys. <laughs> It's very oriented. It's a combination of uh, the new. It's a new romanticism. That's one thing. It's you're focusing on the what's going on in, in the head of people, and the decorative image. So this is quite a decorative image also, and that's to to maybe to push it apart from the the normal. The uh, oil painting that was glazed, and they all looked like uh, yeah, the same, you know. Very, very well suited for naturalism because you get depth and you can very well control the colors and the, you know, the details, etc. This is not, it's a very different image. It's not nature, this is uh, human conditions. So I think the, um, the medium that, that he used was. A very conscious choice. The cardboard that Monk used was could be due to uh, it being a very cheap material, um, and it was quite uh, sturdy. I mean, you, it, it could it could uh, it could take uh, quite a rough handling didn't tear so easily. And even if you got a dent in the surface, you know, or anyway, my monk didn't care. Didn't get a hole anyway. <laughs> but we know that he used cardboard in his early career also when he was at home with his family. Which, which were, his family was quite, uh, not poor, but uh, had a very, uh, very budget was for quite strict. <laughs> So we know that he used the cardboard on both sides and he reused it also. But that was in this very early stage as an artist and student. 
But of course, we see that all the screen versions, we have four of them, have been made on cardboard or paper pasted later on cardboard. I don't know if he did that himself. <clears throat> but it seems that he wanted this expression, that it was very closely tied to, uh, to the support. And I think it was necessary not to, to uh, enhance the structure of, like you find in a, in a canvas painting, that you see the thread pattern. He didn't want that. He just wanted the paint. Edward Monk is not supposed to have used uh, varnish on his paintings. Uh, some art historians have maintained that that is a, a later addition. There was an uproar in this house in the early 19, uh, 19th century, the 20th century actually, <laughs> 1909, which was acquired by the museum, lots of paintings, and they were varnished, and they caused quite an uproar. Even by Monk himself, he commented very harshly on that. But it turns out that um, he used varnish, but very, let's say, partially to enhance some of the parts of his painting to make it look deeper in color, etc. And that's something we can see in the UV, um, when we, <clears throat> we use UV light, and then we get the UV fluorescence, which is visible to the eyes. And you can clearly see that the blue, hazy parts that come out. And you can see where he put it, the, the varnish. It is, it's a resin, natural resin. And you can even see where it's been dripping. So it's clearly done by himself. It's just in the landscape, not in the sky when it comes to, uh, to the, uh, the scream. Yeah, if you're sub <clears throat> subjected to raking light, painting, you can clearly see the, the damage or the, the uh, undulation of the surface. And you see how some of the, the painting is, some of the paint is falling off or it's lifting, so it's about to fall off. But you can also see water damages to the support itself that the, the, the cardboard has swelled. And there are lots of dents and even damages that's clearly retouched by himself. We have had very close uh, <clears throat> contact and uh, collaboration with a um, British chemist, Dr. Brian Singer, who has delivered uh, several thick, vol voluminous <laughs> uh, reports on, uh, on the different parts of the screen we are taking tiny, tiny samples of different parts. So he's identified the medium as uh, casein tempera and some oil and the pigments and also the tallow, which comes from a, probably from a candle and maybe one he Munch used while he was painting during the, the dark hours or, is, you know, put it on against the wall and it rip a candle on the wall and even the bird droppings uh, that to me looked very different from the tallow. So I could see that this is a different substance and I suspected it was uh, bird droppings and was confirmed by Dr. Brian Singer. He could <laughs> had a, a compare, he could compare it to, it to another analysis. It's grayish now, the painting has changed in color. So it was more sparkling, probably more similar to the late uh, Monk Museum version from about 1910. It's not surprising that he used that, you know, he used ours as uh, the basis for his copy or his uh, second, third version. Because I mean, it's not been cleaned, it's, it's always been very brittle. And I think uh, they re realized when it came to the museum that this should not be touched. They, they had no real uh, recipe for treating it. So we're glad that they left it.
Now we're wondering what to do because it's an ongoing process. It's uh, the, the lifting paint is lifting because of the inherent problems of the medium, maybe combined with medium and pigment. So we are looking for a way of conserving it, maybe just passively, like it's put in a vitrine with a, a neutral gas or something. I mean, we have to. Not, it's, it's very hard to touch because of the very matte paint. It, had it been uh, varnished, it would be easier to do, at least to do that without uh, making any visible damages. You always add something. You don't want to do that, but sometimes you have to. I don't know if we are going to do that now. Uh, we'll maybe have a long life ahead of it, but it will slowly degrade probably.